Have you ever dreamed of stepping into the screens of your favorite movies, walking through iconic film sets and seeing how the magic of Hollywood is made? What if you could stand face to face with iconic characters and experience the thrill of blockbuster films firsthand? For a while, studio themed parks like MGM Studios or Universal Studios Florida seem like the next big thing, captivating millions with their unique blend of entertainment and movie magic. But nowadays, this vision seems almost extinct. What happened to these once thriving ideas? Why did the studio's parks fall from grace? Our story begins in 1964. Universal decided to do something unexpected. What if they could bring visitors inside their massive movie sets? The Universal Studios glamour trams were born, featuring designs from Harper Goff. There had been previous attempts to create a tour that would allow guests to go behind the scenes, but the glamour trams were a real success. Why? Well, because they did not disrupt the movie production process, but they also allowed for never-before-seen moments for guests. The glamour trams allowed visitors to traverse actual film sets, witnessing firsthand the intersection of fantasy and reality. Universal would slowly build more facilities for guests, from classic scenes of the Bates Motels from Psycho to thrilling encounters with the mechanical shark in Jaws. The tour provided unparalleled behind-the-scenes experiences, but there were also some great design choices behind it. The guest facilities were located on the upper lot, and thanks to Hollywood's topography, these areas were separate from the main back lot sections. It was the tram that took you there. By the 80s, they wanted something more ambitious a theme park in Florida. You see, themed studios parks could generate revenue from non-theatrical sources, expanding the viability of popular franchises. So why not bring this to Florida? This would be similar to the studios tour, a Hollywood of the East. Disney would also want to get into the game. They would also build a studios tour in Florida. It seems as if Florida would become the new Hollywood, and there were many advantages to that. First was the amount of real estate, allowing for great sound stages and backlot sets, while Los Angeles was crowded. Florida would also be far from all the problems back home, allowing for some cost savings. But most importantly, Florida was already the vacation kingdom of the United States, with the Magic Kingdom and Epcot. People were already visiting this park, so a studio's tour would add to this extensive program. Disney would enter the game with their creative experience. They would create a fantastical version of Hollywood, one of legend and fame. The Chinese theater would be present, working as the park's icon. A Hollywood boulevard would act like a main street. There would be a brown derby. It was not just another restaurant. It added to the theme of the park. But Disney did not have a big live-action movie library. Well, at least one that could compete with Universal. So they had to find a partner, and who better than MGM? The Disney MGM Studios was born. The tour would be the star of the park, exiting from what is today the Star Wars Lunch Bay. The tram would take you behind the scenes, featuring a very extensive program when it originally opened. However, this program would be shortened over the years. The park would be designed to keep the gas areas away from the sound stages and backlots. The only way to see these areas in 1989 was via the backstage tour. Like many great Hollywood studios, MGM would feature its own water tower, but with a dizzy spin. The tour would pass through some backlot sets, like Residential Street, which featured many houses for exterior shots. Then, these small streets turned into bustling New York. Originally, this was part of the tour. Guests could also experience Catastrophe Canyon, which was not based on a particular franchise, but did showcase some important practical effects and added a bit of excitement to the tour. The tour would also include many real movie props in the boneyard, everything from Flight of the Navigator to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Then guests would exit into a break area. Why? Well, because after you disembark the tram, your tour didn't stop here. In fact, there was a second part. While Universal's glamour trams didn't directly take you onto the sound stages, Disney would bring this idea to life. With soundproof windows, guests could glaze onto the production happening below them, or experience how post-production was elevated to the art of cinema. Then this walking tour would end with a presentation of Eisner himself. The park also featured a tour through Disney's imagination, 
with animation. Guests would be able to see real animators working on real productions. Many animators who worked here have found memories of the place. Guests could also embark on the great movie ride. Originally envisioned as an addition to Epcot, this ride showcased the rich history of film. So it became clear MGM wasn't just a thrill park, it was a well-rounded entertainment experience. MGM Studios was designed as a half-day park, something to add to your Disney experience, like River Country for instance. It wasn't originally envisioned as a full park, however, slowly you'll notice that the park started taking over the studio's portion. MGM Studios would open, however, in 1989. It was a smash hit. It brought gas onto a Hollywood that never was, and always will be. However, there was a problem. The park needed more gas areas. Disney would quickly add more attractions to the park, with Star Tours, an expanded version of the groundbreaking attraction, featuring fake sets from indoor outside. Then came the Muppets in 1991, with a 3D show showcasing the Muppets parody 3D technology, and Sunset Boulevard with Tower of Terror in 1994. Meanwhile, Universal was worried that Disney entered the game. How could they compete? Well, by doing what Disney did best. They would produce actual rides. But rethinking this park would not be an easy task. Robert Ward came up with an idea. Why not allow the visitors to step foot onto the back lot? Bob then asked, what would happen if we got rid of the tram? And so Universal Studios Florida would double down on the theme park side. But they still wanted to have a working studio. The designers understood Universal's vision. So this park would showcase the studio side, but also feature groundbreaking mega rides based on key moments from the original tram tour. Rides like Earthquake, Confrontation, and Jaws were born. Because of that, many attractions utilize a soundstage facade. The park would also combine theme and function. The theme park side would also feature a loop pioneered by legendary theme park designer Randall Duo, with different lands of filming locations on each side. Universal Studios Florida would open in 1990. The park had some problems, I mean, most of the rides were not working, but one success emerged, Nickelodeon Studios. Nick was still a growing brand, and so their partnership with Universal allowed for growth, while entertaining guests with live shows. However, as much as these studios parks were a success with guests, there were some problems, the lack of major productions. Unlike the dreams of many designers and executives, this new Florida Studios Park had a hard time convincing entire productions to come to Florida. This was made worse by the fact guests were near the sound stages. Some movies and series were filmed, of course, and in the case of MGM and Universal, it became abundantly clear the theme park side was more successful. MGM Studios was always envisioned as a half-day park when it opened. It was accompanied by other experiences like Pleasure Island and Typhoon Lagoon that would fill out the day. Unfortunately, MGM quickly became a victim of its own success, having to expand the park. But Disney and Universal would not be the only ones to enter this business. Warner Brothers thought they could do it too. In 1986, the Delauntries Entertainment Limited created a studios on the Gold Coast in Australia. This was later purchased by Village Roadshow. They produce and distribute films. However, an idea emerged. What if they could create their own studios park with a partnership with Warner Brothers? Warner Brothers Movie World came to be. This park would be designed by C.V. Wood and would keep most of the studio's area separate from gas. There is a large Main Street area, a stunt show, and areas themed to Warner Brothers characters. The park originally provided a studio tour, but this is no longer active. However, productions are still thriving in the nearby studios, with many blockbuster movies being shot there. Subsequently, Warner Brothers would open new parks in Germany, today known as Movie Park Germany, and Spain, now known as Parque Warner Madrid. This park showcased how a new phase would emerge in studio park design. Instead of having working studios like at Gold Coast, these newer parks would feature sound stages with attractions, working like a themed shed. 
These parks aim to invoke the essence of film industry without the operational constraints of working studios. A dark ride could be easily hidden inside a giant studios building, for instance. Universal Studios would also enter this phase with Universal Studios Japan, as the park integrates themed land and attractions that immerse visitors into cinematic universes. While the park retains the aesthetic elements of a Hollywood studio, it prioritizes immersive experiences over the educational aspects of traditional studios tours. The park did feature some educational rides, like a television tour and animation celebration with Woody Woodpecker, now being substituted with Curious George, but the overall design of Universal Studios Japan blends islands of adventure and Universal Studios Florida, with immersive lands like Jurassic Park and backlot sections in the front of the park, this park created a fun experience for guests. The designers did however enhance the generic decorated box of Studios facades, adding a touch of art modern, bringing in streamlined shapes, creating a more visually interesting area than in previous parks. Universal Studios Japan today is a mega successful park, bringing in millions of visitors. The park once again showcased that the Hollywood theme can work really well. However, as theme parks evolved, so did movie productions. More and more studios started using CGI and green screen technology. This resulted in an almost green set. With the rise of DVD promos and the internet, the aura and intrigue of movie productions, at least from a technical perspective, became more mundane. But what if there was a theme park so bad it removed all hope from the studio theme park genre? Originally envisioned as an European version of MGM Studios, this park would originally feature many similarities to the Orlando counterpart, like a Chinese theater and a backlot. However, there were some upgrades, for instance the entrance would be covered under a studio's building, and the tram tour traveled throughout the park, below bridges creating kinetic energy. This is in my opinion the ideal tram tour, working almost like a train ride. The park would feature working productions as well, but as we all know, Hero Disney was a massive failure, and so plans for this park were quickly cancelled. But the plans for a Hollywood park came back, Walt Disney Studios Park opened in 2002, and it was a massive failure. Considered to be the worst Disney park, it tried to combine classic Disney charm with the everydayness of a backlot. The problem, most of the production aspects were fake. The park did not feature real production stuff, except for the Disney Channel France. But the back lot was just for show and even featured props from defunct Disney attractions like Horizons. This park did not impress and could be considered as the end of a Studios Park. Its failure showcased that a search for quick expansion doesn't always result in profit. To this day, Disney is still trying to fix this park and they want to get away from the bad press of the original park by rebranding it to Adventure World. This is where we enter our next phase in theme park design. Today theme parks have entered a new age, an age where we see more lands based on huge franchises. Learning from the success of the Wizarding World, we have seen this type of experience take over the theme park industry, especially studios parks. MGM, now Hollywood Studios, saw the closure of what remained of its backlot tour this was after decades of neglect and no real productions. By the early 2000s, Disney MGM Studios was in its decadence. With the closure of the walking tour and the end of real production, it seems as if the concept was doomed. I argue the end of the original vision of the park came with the closure of the animation building in 2004 and the loss of real film production there. This was because Disney faced its own challenges in the transition from traditionally hand-drawn animation to CGI. So Hollywood Studios had to change. The park grew more and more, expanding gas facilities with more things to do. Residential Street would be replaced with Lights Motors action. But the biggest change was the addition of Toy Story Land and Galaxy's Edge. It seems as if Disney was more dedicated at creating immersive spaces where guests feel like they stepped into the movies, and Galaxy's Edge is the best example of this. Imagineer Chris Betty said, Our goal was to create a place so authentic, so real, that when our guests step inside, they feel like they are 
in the movie. As so, single IP lands fundamentally reshape the fabric of theme parks by dedicating entire sections to a singular narrative universe. Parks can create deeply immersive experiences that attract dedicated fan bases. However, this approach also presents several critical challenges. On the one hand, single IP lands offer an unprecedented level of thematic cohesion and detail. Visitors are transported into the worlds of their favorite franchises, engaging with characters, environments and storylines in ways previously unimaginable. This level of immersion enhances the emotional connection between the guests and the narrative. This also moves the synergy machine to say so, where companies don't make money only from the box office but also from merchandising, tickets in sales, food and drinks. By leveraging well-established franchises, parks can ensure a steady stream of visitors eager to engage with beloved characters and settings. However, there are some drawbacks. By focusing intensely on specific franchises, parks may inadvertently limit diversity and variety of experiences on offer. The intense focus on single IPs can lead to saturation and fatigue. As new franchises rise in popularity, the relevance of existing IP lands may wane, necessitating constant updates and reinvestments to maintain their appeal. Moreover, what happens when you don't have a blockbuster franchise? This was the problem the original MGM Studios suffered from. By the early 2000s, Disney was not doing so well at the box office, so it became harder to film attractions to failing properties, I mean, who wants to ride a home on the range ride. Even today, Disney faces this challenge. Bob Iger expressed how they might want to wait to expand the parks, because they might just have the next big movie coming up like Frozen, we can see the cracks in this single IP lands start to show up. So we can see a lot of factors contributed to the fall of studios themed parks, whether it's the complexity of real movie productions or a shift in demand in guest expectations. However, the legacy of studios parks lives on. For instance, Universal Studios still builds parks with a Hollywood aesthetic, but now they feature a lake at the center, like Islands of Adventure, the example is Universal Studios Beijing. While Studios Park might seem long gone and a distant memory in the past, they still impose significant cultural relevance. While most guests don't realize it, some production still happens at Universal Studios Florida. I even recall seeing a commercial on TV and thinking, oh, that's... New York at Universal Orlando. The magic of movies still exists, because movies are a state of mind, and as long as we dream and create fantastical spaces, guests will still want to visit them. Whether these are super immersive lands or a simple show, the success of places like the original Universal Studio Store in Hollywood showcase how it's still possible to build the studio-style parks, as long as we find a way to blend technology and the magic of theme parks. People are still fascinated by Hollywood and American culture, and guests will still dream of visiting this world of glitz and glamour, where we enter this Hollywood that never was, and always will be. And cut! <laughs>